asked Kenneth, whom did he refer to when he wrote right wing Jews are weaponizing the IRA? Sure, sure. The, you know, I, in my book, I detail a lot about how the Zionist Organization of America and there's a group called the Amcha and a few others were trying to use the definition first on campus to stop um, or chill uh, speech that they found disagreeable about Israel. Um, so that's one, you know, bucket of, of people that are using it. But then, you know, the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Uh, I mean, I have great respect for some of the people there. I disagree with Mark Weitzman uh, on this, um, but he was the one who pushed the adoption, uh, uh, or among others, he was the, probably the, the most important person who was most promoting the adoption of the IRA definition, uh, the definition, you know, for IRA in 2016. And he... Um, put out a press release when is an Israel apartheid a week uh, event was canceled in the UK because uh, it was alleged to have violated the definition. And what he said was, this is great. Other universities shouldn't allow this either. Uh, first of all, the, the definition doesn't, in my view, outlaw Israel apartheid week in any event. But even if it did, it shouldn't be used that way. So there are the groups that are trying to, and I, I understand, you know, if you step back and think about it, anti-Semitic tropes that may have relationship with Israel, you want to reduce them. But the way to do that is not to define certain speech that's beyond the pale, and that especially we're asking government to get involved in. Um, in the UK, there was a the education minister basically threatened the, the funding of schools that didn't adopt the definition. Um, and that to me is incredibly, uh, you know, problematic. Um, and, and, you know, we, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to go down that road. It, it, it creates an environment where you really can't do anything except discuss, you know, how the definitions are being used as opposed to, again, how do we actually deal with anti-Semitism? And to another example to support what Ken is saying, is about BDS uh, legislation that, you know, people who, uh, if a contractor to a state government in the United States, for example, is actively proponent, proponent of BDS, that somehow that person could not be, uh, you know, a possible candidate for a government contract. Now, these laws are, I mean, almost certainly unconstitutional. I think one of them's already been struck down right. just in the last couple of weeks, but just to even suggest such a thing. And I don't know who exactly was behind the lobbying, but when the German parliament, the Bundestag, uh, declared uh, the BDS to be, you know, to be unacceptable as a form of anti-Semitism. This is not helpful to, again, a conversation about Israel, Palestine that might be uncomfortable. And by the way, um, free speech includes the right to be inaccurate and includes the right to be wrong. So people can make mistakes. And there are people who think BDS is a great idea and other people like myself who don't think it's a great idea. But people have every right in the world to favor it and to uh, engage in it. It is not violent, it doesn't break laws, and it's a form of civil disobedience. And so, you know, why is it that we are now getting involved in trying to tell people what they can and cannot buy? I mean, this is, or, or, or that they cannot advocate for sanctions against a country. And to get to the issue of double standards, which is something I wanted to ask Ken about actually, because you were involved in the drafting of the first IRA iteration. I simply don't get what this means because the wording of the IRA is very strange. It talks about not holding Israel to standards that wouldn't be applied to any other country. Any other democratic any, country. Any other democratic country, which is odd because I don't know of any other democratic country that's been occupying another people for 54 years. That is, yeah. the, the, the circumstances of Israel's creation and its existence are quite unusual. And so, of course, and, and also its location in the center of the Judeo, well, the, the Muslim Christian world, there's going to be reasons why people do get more worked up about Israel, Palestine, than they do about other parts of the world that are not anti-Semitic, even though Israel is um, is a procedurally democratic. So I just don't understand what 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 one was thinking when. Sure, when, sure. Uh, and, I, and I think I addressed that a little bit before, but you're, you're right, Derek. I mean, you know, one of the things I learned from you is again, you know, each uh, country is unique, and each has things that compare to other places, and there are some certain things about Israel, as you pointed, that are unique from any other country. But the concern was, again, remember this, this when was this drafted? This drafted in 2004. So you had the history of the 
UN equating Zionism with racism between 75 and 91 and overt discrimination, including in the UK universities, some places you couldn't have Jewish student groups because to be a Zionist, you were a racist, we don't allow racist groups. Mm -hmm. Then you had the World Conference Against uh, Racism in Durban, which was an anti-Semitic orgy with you know, pictures of Jews you know, with hooked noses and signs that Hitler didn't finish the job and so forth. So that was the, the, you know, sort of background to it. And the, the, you know, again, the idea was people were saying Israel should not have responded at all when, when it was attacked. Um, and you would never, regardless of the, the, the unique circumstances of another country, you would never say that a democratic country has no right to defend itself. If, you know, if somebody from Toronto was sending shells into Buffalo, nobody would say Americans shouldn't do anything. And that was the context, but it, again, as I was explaining before, it's been very distorted uh, to basically say if you're going to criticize Israel for anything, you have to criticize some other things. So you're right. Again, the, the idea was to what do we want to collect data from for reports, for analysis, right. and so forth, as opposed to do we want to label this anti-Semitic or not? There's one of one of the point I want to address too. Um, there's another thing that's going on that I think. It's affecting the dynamic of the discussion in the world about this among the Jewish community. So this debate inside the Jewish community is whether you have to have a particular attitude about Israel to be seen inside the tent. Uh, Sharansky and Gil Troy just wrote a piece, you know, calling un-Jews people who are critical, if not now, and uh, Jewish voice for peace and so forth. Um, you know, that's a debate inside the Jewish community of do you need to have a particular attitude towards Israel to be in or out? What really troubles me about the push to uh, adopt the definition, the working definition, and it would you know, bother me too of any other definition, but this one in particular, as part of law, is you're asking the government to decide this internal question. And that's why you had Kushner at the time of the executive order taking the definition and applying it to the campus, saying, yeah, our policy is anti-Zionism, is anti-Semitism. And that's why you had Pompeo floating, we're going to label Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International uh, anti-Semitic and uh, you know, destroy their funding. That's, they're trying to to answer a debate inside the Jewish community and to have that happen, to have government decide a, essentially an a internal religious question is to me a, a really troubling thing. It just sounds like in the Jewish community, Ken, um, just like the whole world, the Jewish community still doesn't quite know what to do with Israel. That is, on the one hand, most Jews do have a connection with Israel. They feel attached to it in one way or another. Uh, it's certainly the most vibrant uh, and uh, if not already the largest, soon to be the largest Jewish community in the world. Um, and yet no one really knows what to do with a country in which Jews are now sovereign with military force and a country that was created at the expense of another people and occupying another people. And it is tempting and easy, it seems to then conflate hostility towards that country and anger at that country with anger against Jews broadly understood. And uh, yes, of course it does when you know, Jews in the streets of Paris get attacked because they're Jews, because someone's angry at Israel. This is clearly an anti-Semitic an anti act. But what do we do? And I don't really have an easy answer to this because it is very, um, I was at another event recently where someone pointed out, yes, I mean, uh, you can say that this kind of very angry speech about Israel and apartheid and genocide or whatever kind of ethnic cleansing, you know, very angry language people can use. You can say, well, it's directed towards Israel because Israel is a country that occupies another people. But yes, it is easy for that angry language to then escalate into violence, physical violence. And I don't have an easy answer to this because I know that constitutionally people should have free speech rights and that the conversation towards helping the situation can only move forward if people in the Jewish community acknowledge what's really happening on the ground in Israel-Palestine. But on the other hand, I am aware, as you were when you created this definition in the first place, um, that one kind of angry language can lead to violent actions. I don't know if you have insights about. Sure, sure. And, you know, again, I, I, I live in America. I'm a, you know, argue constitutional cases in court. Um, and, you know, to me, the, the, the bottom line of this, of course, words can hurt and speech can hurt and could lead to things. So one of the objections um, 
it was interesting that South Carolina adopted a, a version of the definition at one point, or, and it was contentious, and a rabbi said, why is this contentious? You know, Hitler didn't kill anybody with his hands. Words, of course, led, all he did was words, and words led to genocide, and how could we be against adopting something that would stop this type of speech? And the former general secretary of the American Association of University Professors and I wrote a response saying, yeah, you know, words can in fact hurt, but you can't ignore the fact that the reason that Nazi Germany was able to succeed so well in terms of its murderous plot against Jews is partly that it was suppressing dissent. And if you look at the question of do you want to have the government decide what can be said and what can't be said, um, things that are not, you know, uh, direct incitement, uh, you know, immediate, you know, go get that person over there, they're a Jew, that type of thing. The governments historically have uh, decided to stop speech that they don't like. What was, you know, the Trump administration talking about? We talking about, you know, things other than the Black Lives Matter speech they were talking about. Can we suppress some of that? So that's a very dangerous thing to government that that the power. And then the larger frame is, again, you know, larger discussion, what should we be doing about combating anti-Semitism? I think there's a strong case to be made that there's a correlation between strength of democracy and the capacity to fight any form of hatred. And when democracy, you know, our institutions, free press, judiciary, so forth, are under strain, um, that makes it more difficult. So, you know, when, when we're trying to really give power to governments to be more autocratic in terms of deciding what speech is okay and what speech isn't, that to me is a prescription for disaster. It doesn't mean we're silent about the speech that we find hateful. It doesn't mean we don't educate it. It doesn't mean we don't, you know, uh, lobby uh, Congress and other places. It doesn't mean we don't, you know, support people who are going to make this a priority. Um, you know, there are a whole bunch of things to do, but we try to simplify it say, ah, this is something we don't like. We think it could lead down the road to something. Let's suppress it. Uh, that's always historically going to backfire.